So after that fantastic session, what better but to start with a title which I have to give honor to the person was John Bakakis' idea uh, on you know a panel on the ubiquity of translation. We had three papers that wildly and widely demonstrated that, going from sex to gender and genre and politics. <laughs> so we had already quite a bit of ubiquity of translation uh, earlier today. Now, this is what we decided to do today was rather than having keynote speakers, we are going to have this morning and this afternoon keynote conversations, uh, which seems to me a, a nice way of doing it. So we've got three uh, speakers. Um, this morning, who will give us very short presentations, about 10 minutes each, and then we'll open that up to discussion. Uh, I may have some questions, but most of all, you may have some questions to ask them. And we have three very distinguished speakers um, in the order in which they will speak, but I'll present them now so we can then be quite um, fluid afterwards. So we have Professor Sven Eric Larsen from the University of Auris, or Auris. If, if, whether you want to pronounce it sort of um, the Danish way or, or the English way, uh, um, who is currently a Leverhulme uh, visiting professor at UCL in London and working there on uh, a project on forgiveness as a form of cultural exchange. Challenge. Sorry, sorry, cultural challenge. And uh, he also, uh, well, one of the things that I know, um, for instance, about Sven Derek is that he's very interested in translation, but also in the areas such as uh, self-translation. And he's been involved in a, a special issue of uh, a journal called Orbis Literarum, which I uh, recommend that you all look out for. It's coming out anytime now. Yeah. Uh, and it's devoted to self-translation. <coughs> Following Sven Derek, we're going to have uh, Professor John Rakakis of Stirling University and Glyndor? Well, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Welsh to me. Yes. <laughs> I, didn't com I didn't comment on the translation, <laughs> on the pronunciation. <laughs> John, uh, of course, I say, is, is, is one of the foremost uh, Shakespearean scholars. He has um, his uh, edition, his Arden edition of The Merchant of Venice that just came out at the end of last year and has been described to me already as a blessing. Oh, yes. um, uh, and he's also um, contributing to a volume of Macbeth, which is going to come up very soon, is currently in press, and a special issue of politics today uh, on beyond the new um, historicism. And then closing this um, panel, uh, but then opening it up for discussion at the same time, is going to be Professor Susan Basnett. And I think the only thing I need to say about Susan is that translation studies is now, she's just sent to press, literally, the fourth edition of what was and still is that fantastically seminal uh, book. And she's also um, working, or, or is it finished? The, the <laughs> translation's just finished. The translation volume for the new Critical Idioms series. Um, so look out for that as well. So these are our three speakers. The topic is the ubiquity of translation. Over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. One thing. I've got an, a handout for Sven Derek, which I'll pass around now. It's just a bibliographical, set of bibliographical references. Well, translating languages you don't know, I should have said I don't know, just to be quite honest. I, you never, I never know about you. But with this title, I have made it easy for myself, it seems. There cannot be very much to say. And yet, apparently it's easy to make a distinction between languages I know and languages I don't know. We often more or less intuitively understand knowledge of language as knowledge of grammar and vocabulary with complete correctness as the often implicit criterion for knowledge. Implicit because we know that many native speakers do not speak correctly, at least not all the time, or write, I mean we are correcting student papers, all of us. For professional purposes, we then make a typology of languages we know according to reading, speaking, and writing skills as we do in our CVs. But languages we don't know are just that, languages we don't know. This is misleading, both with regard what it means to know a language and to translate, and also because professional knowledge only occupy one corner in the vast house of languages. Instead, I will propose the following definition of what it means to know a language. We know a language when we have sufficient metalinguistic skills to ask about what we don't know in certain situations and receive a relevant answer. That is to say, 
we are able to perform a translation within the same language. Like if I say, and I've forgotten a word in English, which happens very often, you know, I have a hammer, there is a wall, I want to hang a picture, but what the hell is this damn thing called I'm trying to hit with my hammer? And I know John very well, so he would, he, he would say immediately, your thumb, stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One thing is important here. The distinction between foreign language mother tongue is not relevant for that definition. As we know, we may also have troubles with intralinguistic translations within, with regard to earlier stages of our own languages or one's own language, which then will be a language I don't know if I don't have metalinguistic skills. John knows all about it, commenting on the art in Shakespeare to remedy this situation with footnotes and comments and what have we. So my first point here with regard to translation is that knowledge of language is a functional category that can be described in terms of translation. From the importance of translation, then follows my second point, where there is one language, there is at least always another one present. Languages come in clusters. To say the two simple words, one language, is clear and understandable, <coughs> but is an abstraction that does not correspond to the reality of languages, although native speakers of world languages like English may fall victim to that illusion. Those of us who were born in small languages may be one language behind you, but we are one experience ahead of you in terms of knowledge about languages come in clusters. So now back to the languages I don't know. We can now characterize them as languages where I have no metalinguistic skills. But can I still translate? Yes, of course I can. Look at this little booklet here. <coughs> It's called pointed, no texts, <laughs> just context-specific images. <clears throat> As languages are never decontextualized, the same goes, of course, for metalinguistic skills. They form an integral part of a larger field of metasemiotic skills, together with which they always operate. Just look at the speakers here with facial expressions or gestures and body language and what have we. And this is so simply because where there are languages, there are also always other media due to the fact that languages are not primarily structural phenomena but embodied phenomena. So hence, knowing a language, not knowing a language, sorry, is not an absolute statement but a relative one, depending on the possibilities of evoking metasemiotic skills. Therefore, we can differentiate non-knowledge of languages as we can specify knowledge of languages, but in a different way. Which means, of course, that non-knowledge now can be expressed in positive terms. Let's first look at this suggestion of levels involved in translation uh, and therefore, in the practical exercise of meta-linguistic skills, I have borrowed this from Susan's earlier work. I don't know if you remember it. It was something you did with... No, no. Yeah, yeah. Will you accept it? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Something you did with Andre way back. In one of those articles, Susan has written either translation as culture or culture as translation or translation and culture. I mean, these kind of things, right, yeah. Yeah. Except you've rewritten it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's part of the rewriting of translation studies. Book. But anyway, there are those four, four levels you mentioned. It's not exhaustive, but no matter. Each of these levels offer, and that's the point, offer meta levels through which some kind of translation can be formed and indicate various types of what it means not to know a language. I do not know enough grammar to convey a verbal translation, but I know enough of the cultural context to exercise some metalinguistic skills that may work in certain situations. In certain cases, this fact, at least for professionals, is a disturbing fact, even appalling fact. 
but that's a fact of the real life of languages and translations. And even if we don't know the information level or everything, we may create efficient translations without the translator knowing, in the sense of point one here, uh, the language is translated from. Whereas he or she knows almost only the cultural context. Apart from this very, very useful book, I have traveled China with this one and I got something to eat. Mm -hmm. I got a bed at night and uh, I even went to the uh, pharmacy to get something. Yeah. <laughs> but here we have from 1907, we have the German Hans Betke, who translated a collection of Chinese poetry, Die, Ch Die Chinesische Flöte, without knowing a word of Chinese, but only a lot about it, and a lot really. It was based on existing translations in French, English, and German, and became largely influential. Already in 1908, Gustav Mahler used it for his Das Lies von der Erde. So Betke went on after that on translating Oriental poetry right up to his death in 1946. He didn't know any Oriental languages, but he created a Germany in Germany, a genuine literary interest in the area and also stimulating a professional knowledge of culture and languages of Asia. We could call this for a context-specific non-knowledge or, as I would prefer, a context-specific knowledge, which I myself practice in the classroom when I teach Dostoevsky in translation, and we all do. The lesson is here, which is my fourth point. Translators, like languages, never act alone. It might be written on the front page, translated by, but that's a fiction, an abstraction for the benefit of publishers and uh, things like that, or maybe our personal CVs. Languages are interactive cross-linguistic <coughs> phenomena and so are translators and translations. They always work through collaboration either in an actual group or as Betke, indirectly through other translations, dictionaries, contextual information, etc., etc. In spite of Dante's divulgario, divulgari eloquentia, the first word does not exist. The same goes for translations. The first translation ever does not exist because it is against the very working of languages. They are shaped and transformed through interactions from the very beginning of the ex ex existence of languages. I will finish this brief presentation with two other types of what I will call non-knowledge of language or translation from languages I don't know, both of which are relevant and useful for all of us as scholars. I have the contextual one just before. I think I have it. Yeah. We have the metasemiotic contextual. Now we come to the two last ones. Uh, for the first one there. We know, let's take the case, we know the general structure of a certain language and with the use of a dictionary, maybe existing translations or a conversation with learned colleagues, we can then operate within a text for specific purposes. I will call this type of non-knowledge of a language covering my first example in a little while for a structural knowledge containing very little semantic contents, scarcely a rhetorical or stylistical knowledge, but a good deal of contextual knowledge. In my second, second example, I take the case that I know single words and that is all there is. In positive terms, I will call that termin terminological knowledge. We use it when we guess meanings of loan words from Latin, for instance. And for doctors and botanists, this type of non-knowledge of a language is crucial. Or French for chefs. If you see the menus written in French, you know that they don't know the language. But they are very good, they are very good cooks anyway. <laughs> and they know what his sauce is, Hollandaise sauce is called, and what have you. For us, this kind of knowledge mostly works within Indo European languages because we have a certain pre established knowledge of the basic structure with verbs, nouns, a phrase structure of a certain layout, a grammatical subject, an object, and what have we. 
and we also probably share some knowledge of literary genres. If we then use the knowledge of a cultural context, a general knowledge of structure, genre, rhetoric, it is actually possible to choose between translations from languages we don't know, except for an overall, uh, we don't know, except for an overall structural layout and isolated terms. My examples here for those two things are an English translation of the ending of Njal's saga. You have the references to the books I will be talking about on the layout. I have a structural knowledge, in that sense, of Old Norse, but I can't produce any metalinguistic things where I could ask an Old Norse scholar, what, I've forgotten this word, what does it mean? And three translations I will also show of the ending of Euripides' Hippolytos. I have a thin and selected terminological knowledge of Greek, and that's all. In both cases, the translations I'm concerned with has to do with the term forgive. I'm working on that project of forgiveness right now. Well, at the end of Njal's saga, um, the old Norse honor and shame culture based on retaliation or negotiated settlements in the case of transgressions has reached a dead end. The word forgive, which in Icelandic is furia jevir, very close to uh, forgive, only occur once, only once in all the sagas taken together, and then in a few religious writings. I think there are three or four occurrences, that's all. So this is not a term in Icelandic, but the, but the problem of forgiveness, of course, exists. How do you translate that when you have text here? The case is that the outlawed Flosi has fled from Iceland, and Kari, who want a blood revenge instead of Flosi being outlawed, follows him through Europe to kill him. He doesn't do that, but he has a few other killings on his conscience. I mean, they are not very particular about numbers when it comes to killings in, <laughs> in Iceland. Yeah. And they now end up in Rome, both of them at different times and they are absolved by the Pope. In the English translation by Robert Cook in the Penguin Classics, he takes the Icelandic word, which is takalaus, which means to set free. Laus, loose, uh, set free. Uh, he takes that and translates it as receive absolution, which is semantically correct. But culturally, it's out, totally out of context. So, um, the English term refers to an established Christian institutional context, whereas the Icelandic word is just an everyday word for a phenomenon they don't know about, mirroring the fact that nobody really knows what the Christian values and practices are. The whole point of the saga is exactly that. We are in a pre-institutional period of a transition to Christianity and centralized institution without the terms to cover that institution yet. It's narrated or it's written down in the end of the 13th century uh, in some of the convents, but we are still in a transitional period. And even there, the notions are not established. So takalos will be that expression. Now, when the two Vikings meet again, the translation says that they made a full reconciliation. That's what they do. That's correct. But in Icelandic, the text actually shows the problems with using these proto-Christian terms for the event. The normal term for reconciliation here is not reconciliation, but that's a settlement. Mm -hmm. And the word in Icelandic is a sat, as you have in settlement. Sat is the word you have there. And that means one will pay the other a fine or something in exchange for damage done. But actually what is new here in the an extraordinary Icelandic context is that nobody pays anything. So the settlement word, which is the only they have, doesn't cover what they want to say. So the Icelandic phrase is very, very strange in Old Norse as it would be when I translated literally in English. They settled a complete settlement. I mean, this is pleonastic, and that, that's strange, that the object is contained in the verb already. You would say make a settlement or negotiate a settlement, but you will not settle a settlement. 
And on top of that is written, they were settled and complete settlement, which is pleonastic, because if you have a settlement, it's complete, otherwise it's not a settlement. You may break it, but the settlement is complete. So here the language, in a compact way, illustrates this transitional period in the culture and the whole terminology with which you deal with law and sense of justice here. And the English <coughs> context simply doesn't catch that. So, this, my second and last example here has to do with the Greek text. In Hippolytus, uh, it's just uh, terminology, uh, uh, terminology here. The end of Hippolytus is that Hippolytus has been accused of uh, uh, having a crush on his, his stepmother, uh, uh, Phaedra, and Tiseus, his father, is up in arms, he's very macho on everything. And uh, he calls on his father, Poseidon, and says, kill that bloody bastard, he's going to bed with my wife. Which Poseidon, of course, does, because he has promises. And gods, although, no, although the god knows that it's wrong, they have to do it because they have made a promise. So that's really a predicament, you can say here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Artemis, this ice cold lady, is we call it behind everything. I mean, he doesn't love love in, in, uh, like love in any, any way. So she gives then Hippolytus, who came like a kind of, he's absolutely bloody, he's like a topped over bottle of. Uh, of, of jam and uh, jar, uh, strawberry jam they're laying on the stage for once. Very rare in Greek tragedy, you have them on stage. Yeah. But then Artemis said, you are permitted to forgive, we will say, your father. But she doesn't say forgive. She has to use the, the word to loosen or set free, just like in Icelandic, which is luo, which means like setting free from prison or setting uh, a, a dog free from from the uh, lees and so on and so forth. So it's kind of setting free in that very visceral sense. Now, when we come to Hippolytus, something happens here. How to translate various words for forgiveness when that term does not exist in Greece? For a modern audience, maybe even spoken on stage. So in the Christian sense, which by the way, I must say, is also ambiguous about forgiveness, of course, it does not exist in Athens in the fourth century BC. On the other hand, translations are made for an audience in the Christian area, or post, if you like, Christian area, with knowledge of Christianity. At the same time, terms for other forms of reconciliation do exist. But as guilt in the modern sense does not exist either, only hamartia, which is mentioned also in the text, as a radical error determined by fate, then a translation that is supposed to work without footnotes to be read from stage will have some difficult choices to make. Moreover, the terms pity and fear, elios and phobos, related to the emotional effect of tragedy are very different from the modern European Western notions of emotions shaped by the Enlightenment discourse on emotions, which is a difficulty for students, you know, when you read and explain what pity means. In the Greek context, it is pity and fear because we are we can never be set free from the divine obscurity of fate. So when Artemis says set free, this is really radical. She does not ask him to forgive guilt, but to set somebody free from the consequences of the fate which evokes pity and fear in the tragedy. This is not clear in the translations. We have there are three translations, you can see them here. Um, when what Hippolytus does is to set his father free from the pity caused by the consequences of divine fate. And if you look into the terms here, you can see that that is what Artemis says in this literal sense. What he says, and what is very well translated by Kovac, where is his, his, well, that's the translation there, yeah, yeah, David Kovac, is you see here, here we have the word pity, Elios, hidden in the verb, meaning that she said set free in the literal sense. What Hippolytus does, he understands what that means. I'm setting you free from the context in which we feel pity. So it's another verb used there which fits into the Greek uh, context. Now, and of course, out of way, giving forgive, totally mistranslates that. And Philip Bellacott, who has written a very, very good book on Euripides, he says absolve, but I think that's wrong too, uh, just like in the case of Njal. 
Uh, but it's closer, and he has to have one word which can be understood by the public, that this is really something radical happening there at the end of the tragedy. Well, now, what is even more complicated in that case is, of course, that the Gospels are written in Greek too. And they needed to come up with words for forgiveness. And what happens here is that the standard Greek work, which is used in the final tragedies of Euripides, but otherwise not, it's a word which means generosity, forbearance, magnanimity, and things like that, which we know in honor and shame cultures. And that's signomi. And then we have the gospel Greek coming in, which take a totally different word. Uh, and that is aphesis, or the verb, various verbs and declinations, which I cannot. And that means more a remission, like from a debt, like, like a pardon <laughs> or something like that. And that's the word which in the Greek Gospels is the word for forgiveness almost in 90% of the cases when Jesus is speaking or somebody else is speaking there. And then we have St. Paul, who also are reflecting on this message of forgiveness. But he's writing, as you know, 30 to 40 years before the Gospels. So he didn't have the vocabulary from the Gospels, just like in the Icelandic case almost, so he didn't have the vocabulary for receive absolution there. And he uses another word. He uses the word charizomai, which means to forgive in the sense of being generous, have it show forbearance, like in the, oh sorry, up to you, <laughs> like in the standard Greek sense here, but with another word not to be mixed up with the traditional word from a non-Christian context. So that's St. Paul's choice, but that's the choice of the Gospels, which now is the Greek word for forgiveness in a Christian context. I don't know anything about Greek, basically, but I know quite a lot about the context of the word forgiveness. I cannot translate, I cannot evaluate the translation as a whole, but I can trans evaluate the translation on very particular points where this context and this interpretation is relevant. And that's what I call terminological non-knowledge or knowledge, and it's very, very useful for us as teachers and scholars. Thank you. Yeah, yes, because um, I don't think John and, and Susan have got visual, oh, yeah. so if you want to just turn your tables and come up here. Oh, thank you. Uh, exactly. We're coming. Yeah. We're coming. I think we're going to go straight over to you, John, and then to Susan, and then we'll just open it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I've just got a very simple title, um, Intralingual Translation. Um, and let me start by reminding this audience, because they know it already, um, with a statement uh, from Jacobson's on the linguistic aspects of translation, which says, the meaning of any linguistic sign is its translation into some further alternative sign, unquote. And I want to draw your attention as well to something that you already know, um, to two of the three kinds of translations that he describes. One, intralingual translation or rewording, which he says is an interpretation of verbal signs by means of other signs of the same language. Secondly, interlingual translation, or what he calls translation proper, which is an interpretation of verbal signs by means of some other language. And there's a third category that I'm not going to be concerned with, but Sven Denek has actually <coughs> touched on it, uh, intersemiotic translation or transmutation that Jacobson says is an interpretation of verbal signs by means of signs of nonverbal sign systems. Now, I don't want to concern myself with that category, but in a moment I think you might feel that it's not entirely irrelevant uh, to the argument I want briefly to launch. I want to stick to the first two categories, partly because it gives me the opportunity to draw your attention to Susan Bassnett's fourth edition, would you believe, of Translation Studies, which is shortly to appear, and also, of course, to give you some advance notice of a new book of Susan's on translation that's in press as we speak and is going to appear very soon in the new Critical Idiom series. She's going to pay me for this afterwards. Um, <laughs> um, 
nepotistical you, up there. You were the editor of the Tardis series, right? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. I forgot. That. <laughs> Zoop. <laughs> okay. I, I want to raise a question about the relationship between the first two of Jacobson's categories. And I'll put the matter bluntly. Um, if, as he argues, the meaning of any linguistic sign is its translation into some further alternative sign, then categories one and two of the tripartite definition that he offers represent a distinction without a difference. I'm, of course, aware that at one extreme, the second category is the one that we've most commonly associated with the act of translation although the process of establishing meaning by what Jacobson uh, labels rewording is something that's common uh, to both categories. Now, the reason why I, I raise this issue now uh, is that it goes back to my first year as a university undergraduate. I think the older you get, your long memory becomes much more vivid. You can't remember <laughs> what you did yesterday, but you can remember what happened 40 odd years ago. Um, and it was a question that I was asked in the first ever university tutorial that I attended. It was like going into a foreign country, really. Um, I was puzzled by the question then, and, and to be candid, I'm still puzzled by it. Um, I was presented with the following speech from Shakespeare's Hamlet. And I'll read it to you. It's quite a long speech, but just to refresh your memories. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him, or he to her? that he should weep for her. What would he do had he the cue, uh, the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculty of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy-metalled rascal, peak like John of dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this? Ha! Ah! Soons I should take it, for I cannot be, it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter, or ere this should have fatted the region kites with this slave's offal. Bloody, bawdy villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain, or as Sven Derek would say, bloody bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Why, what an ass am I! that is most brave, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very drab, a scullion. Fire by it, oh, about my brains. Hm. I've heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have, by the very cunning of the scene, been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions, for murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. Now, I must not have looked away quickly enough, because I was then addressed by my tutor by name. And in those days, you know, I mean, what someone asked you a question, and you told me, immediately looked away, looked down, you know, made yourself invisible. I, I was addressed, Mr. Drakakis, that was how they addressed, or Miss. I don't think there were many Misseses, and certainly no Misses. Um, <laughs> and I was then asked to translate this speech. Now, just imagine my consternation. <laughs> An inarticulate 17-year-old being asked to translate into English a speech that was written in English, albeit, of course, in an idiom that was completely unfamiliar to me. And I wasn't unfamiliar with Shakespeare at the time. Of course, since I'd been curious enough to read the footnotes in the prescribed edition of the play, I could gloss particular words 
insofar as I was able to find the odd verbal equivalent in modern English for words that were current in the uh, late 16th century. And I did perform an elementary version of what I know no textual editors do. But I very quickly realised under what became a relentless grilling, you know, that idea that the tutor senses a weakness and then goes in for the kill and <laughs> won't let you off the hook, <laughs> that I really didn't understand this protracted utterance at all. I mean, how on earth could I have forced my soul so to my own conceit? Who on earth was Hecuba? And how could I, a dull and muddy metal rascal, peak like John of Dreams? I mean, I was busy languishing there, but I mean, I didn't know that. Now, the Arden Two editor, Harold Jenkins, offered me a very helpful translation of the first clause, you know. He says, that which is conceived in the mind and may have no external reality. Sounded good to me. And his gloss of the third clause is a nickname like John and Nods. I'd never heard of that either. Um, <laughs> for a listless, dreamy fellow. And then in brackets, A equals of. Now, probably current in familiar speech, though otherwise recorded only in Robert Armin's Nest of Ninnies in 1608, I was told. I didn't know who Robert Armin was, and I'd never heard of a Nest of Ninnies. Here were ways of talking about the soul. Here were ways of talking about imagination, completely foreign to me, not to mention the aphoristic John of Dreams, who apparently peaked. <laughs> now... Of course, what I was encountering, but of course I didn't know it at the time, was a version of what Jacobson referred to as equivalence in difference, that he took to be the cardinal problem of language. Now, I knew that this was a soliloquy in blank verse, but in order to reach some form of cognition of this particular speech, I was being required to produce a recoding reinterpretation that, of course, for Jacobson is translation. But, of course, I also had another set of problems. I mean, Hamlet's a fictional character being represented by an actor. I knew that much. And in addition to being invited to translate what the character actually utters, I needed to acknowledge what Kwame Anthony, uh, Anthony Appiah has called a Groysian mechanism, the act that achieves its purpose because its purpose is, is recognised. Now, the question here would be for me, of course, what was Hamlet's purpose and could I recognise it? to which the answer of both was no. Uh, <laughs> it was a question that presupposed a knowledge of what soliloquy uh, as a literary genre was, and all I had to go on was the image of thinks. I read a lot of comics by then, um, which was and continues to be in some usually film versions uh, uh, of the play the way in which they deal with soliloquies. Now, moreover, the question was being addressed to me within an institutional context whose rules I had no idea about, um, as indeed do most students when they first come into university. They're completely befuddled by what's happening. Um, and I knew that Shakespeare was a special case, but I had yet to figure out what, might, uh, what this might entail in terms of his iconic value. Now, had I the wit and the dexterity, the verbal dexterity, I might have responded to the question by recasting the soliloquy in a passage of Eliotian blank verse. Uh, although, of course, with a very thick Cardiff accent. Uh, <laughs> which would have done serious damage to Eliot, I can tell you. Um, I was not, I hasten to add, uh, being asked to infer Hamlet's intentions from the speech, much less to speculate about what Shakespeare's intentions might have been. I was baffled by this sort of persistent hesitation and I was impatient for a swift resolution to what at the time seemed to me to be a simple problem uh, that I'd encountered, of course, in a misspent youth of watching westerns. You know, somebody does something to you, shoot them. Um, it's informed my politics ever since. Um, but Appiah wants to take the discussion beyond these Groysian concerns in order, he says, to begin to have a literary understanding that requires us, quote, usually to first know its language well enough to be able to identify what the intentions conventionally associated with each of its sentences are, the kind of context. But he also goes on to say, and I quote, that we must grasp not merely the literal intentions, but the whole message that would be communicated by the utterance of the sentences in more ordinary settings, metaphor and implicature, he says, as they occur in fiction, occur also outside it. 
course, if we reason too simply from this, then we draw some elementary conclusions based on a naive mimesis that can claim that Elizabethans naturally spoke in blank verse and that they talked a lot to themselves. Um, <laughs> took me a long time to realize that when Hamlet says, I am not alone, he means literally that he's isolated from the other dramatic characters with whom we've seen him interacting and that the character actor is now acknowledging the theatre audience as an interlocutor that makes of soliloquy something very different. Mm. Now, the problem with Hamlet's soliloquy, as I experienced it then, is that it had no outside with which to compare it other than my own. So that try as I might, I was unable to make that leap of historical imagination that it requires, that's required when dealing with texts from the distant past. And even then, as I found subsequently, I can't submerge my own subjectivity totally in the object of my attention. If I want to speak with the dead, then not only do I have to hear my own voice, but I also need to recognise what it contributes to my heavily overdetermined formulation of whatever it is that I seek to produce a narrative account of. The activity is what we now call presentism. Now, is this quite so innocent a process as it might first seem? Anthony Appiah is concerned with what goes into the making literary texts and how their translation from one language to another is linked with the institutional practices of reading. Reading, he suggests, provides an answer to the question, what modes of reading are productive? And he goes on to say that, quote, they will derive from an ethics and a politics of literary pedagogy from a sense of why we should teach text, which we should teach, what this teaching is worth to our students, and so on. And he concludes that, and I quote, a thick description of the context of literary production, a translation that draws on and creates that sort of understanding, meets the needs to challenge ourselves and our students to go further, to undertake the harder project of a genuinely informed respect for others, until we face up to difference, we cannot see what price tolerance is demanding of us. Now, Appiah is availing himself here, of course, of a new historicist Goetzean formulation, whereby a particular object of inquiry, in Goetz's uh, case, uh, another culture, has a depth that it is the responsibility of the inquirer to probe. Now, we can see immediately what this might lead to in relation, say, to a post-colonial context where the question of hierarchies of texts and how they are assembled and valued can become politically incendiary. But I want to suggest that the process is no less controversial when we deal with texts of the distant past. This is not to say that readings of texts from a culture's own past is simply a matter of interpretation. Rather, it signals that we need to be a lot clearer than we are about the boundaries that separate what are, in effect, forms of translation as part of the process of reading and understanding. Now, nor do I want to claim that translation is everywhere or that everything is translation. In a purely common sense way, it clearly isn't. But the attempts to modernize a text along the lines that we see regularly in film and theater performances and, of course, in textual editing of Shakespeare follow many of the principles of translation, as indeed does the practice, as I say, of scholarly editing and glossing. The problem with the labeling of certain academic areas, such as the post-colonial, or one might say even more the Gothic, which is of course a, a very trendy one, is that in making claims to terminological ubiquity, they dilute the distinctions that they begin by making. Now if these terms are as ubiquitous as it's often claimed they are, then they lead to distinctions without differences. And we need to be very careful that we don't elide these important and implicitly deeply political differences into a fashionable fudge. I mean, unlike Coleridge, I could never put myself wholly in Hamlet's position. My daughters might have something to say about that, however. Um, much less to be able to articulate his dilemma in his own terms, even by means of a straightforward quotation. I may be able to abstract and distill an essence from the text, and I may be able to repeat a version of his dilemma in a cultural context that's familiar to me as an italo grecophile Celt who occasionally teaches English in Scotland. But this is exactly the point at which translation and interpretation converge, 
and within a language as well as between languages. Thank you. Susan, so, over to you. Right. Can you oh, just you move up a bit? No. Oh, no. yeah, all right. We'll so, just, okay, so just put my stuff on. Chairs. Right. Just so I can put my papers, the papers down. Right. 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 <coughs> I knew the old boys would write proper papers, having told me that, oh, no, we'll just do it off notes, they said. We'll just do it off notes. So I've now, I've just done it off notes. So I've now we got lied, to try and... Susan. You lied, you lied, I know. You should have made a proper translation. You know us. <laughs> I know them. <laughs> I know them. I'm sure it goes back to their maternal spaces and how mothers like to dance. <laughs> I think it probably does. We could discuss this afterwards. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> They're both staying overnight with me tonight, so I think I might have a few words over the table. Right. Um, I, I, I'm also, I mean, uh, I'm also going to start off, in a sense, with, with Jakobsen, with the intralingual, interlingual, intersemiotic. Um, ways of thinking about translation because I do think it's it is still a very very useful starting point. It's a, a good way of just beginning to to think about translation. And I also I'm 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 um, I think partly because of having been been updating translation studies and thinking about providing introductions to translation. <coughs> I've also gone back and looked again um, at the whole German Scopos theory, which Hans Vermeer pioneered. Now, I was very struck to see that Edwin Gensler had pointed out in, in his book on theories of translation that Scopos theory, or functionalist theory, is, as he puts it, possibly the most important development in translation theory in 2,000 years. That's a huge claim. But it's an interesting one, because, of course, the, the, the whole point about functionalist theory is that you jettison, um, basically, all notions of close textual equivalence in favour of focus on what the function of the text is. What's it doing? What's it for? Um, and this clearly for anybody involved in interpreting or anybody involved in all kinds of, 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 of translation. You translate um, in, in legal texts, in, in instruction manuals, anything like that. You're translating what the objective of that text is rather than a close textual analysis, which isn't to say that I'm, I'm not actually very, very interested, and we we're talking about this over the coffee break, uh, following those three really very fine papers this morning. I'm interested in how many younger scholars are now moving back to kinds of textual analysis that we haven't seen for a while. There does seem to be a return. I see several people nodding in the room, and I think this is hugely positive, that instead of vague generalizations, we come back to text. But what I, what I want to do today is just to raise two problems of translation, two particular problems that I don't know, quite know how to categorise. I don't know how to um, explain them in terms of functionalist theory, and I don't know how to explain them in terms of Jakobson's inter-intra-intersemiotic. And so, um, after, you know, the old boy's kind of intellectual heights, I'm going to bring you right down to the depths, and I'm going to um, go to the problems of translating a term, a single term to start off with. Um, it's an Italian word. It's a neologism. It's a new word that has come in um, in the last few years. And it's a word that refers to a particular context. It refers to the women, they are all women, who in Rome look after stray cats. They feed them. They... Um, they make sure they're sterilised, you know, so they don't overbreed. They, and the neologism that is coming is la gattara. <laughs> gattara. The plural, le gattare. You find it uh, uh, in, in 
Uh, I think it's a journalistic term originally. It comes in through journalism. So discussing this in Italy last week with friends, um, I said, you know, this is the case I'm going to take to my talk next week because how do you translate it? At which one friend said, well, can't you say a catter? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, you all laugh, but why not? Why can't we say a catter? They are catters. No, we could say cat ladies, but that instantly brings up a huge cultural difference. They can't, we can't what? have cat women because of Batman and... and so. what? Why not Katerina? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, you see my dilemma now. The dilemma is, what do we do with this? It's a neologism. As I say, we can't have cat ladies we can't have because they are really not ladylike at all. I mean, they're actually pretty aggressive. Um, and they've got themselves quite well organised, you know, around Largo Argentina and so on. I mean, they're... they're that's right. Well. Yeah, they're, they're, they're well organised. Um, so this is a social phenomenon. It's a, a, a particular phenomenon for which I simply can't find any term and I have to then go into a rather lengthy explication of what it is. Um, I, can't even f I can't even explain it properly because I started out by saying women who look after cats. But that's not it. Cat campaigners. Female cat welfare campaigners. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Cat keepers. Cat keepers. <laughs> Well, we could, we could keep playing with this one. But, it's, but it is actually, it's, it's an interesting thing because the, the, the other point is that how this term also, given um, how, how language changes, this, this is a term that is also subject to kind of shifting uh, bias depending really where it is being used because it can now be used disparagingly. So it can be a kind of term of abuse, like that. That's out, they're out again. Um, but, so it's, it's, it's a very problematic term, and I don't know how, in, in, when translating it, I don't quite know how to describe the process of translating. I don't know how to fit it in, either to my functionalist, because there isn't anything, there isn't a similar function anywhere else that I can think of. I mean, I can remember as a little girl, it usually was old ladies with newspaper parcels of usually leftover pasta. Um, that people would take along. My auntie was one of them. There you yeah. go. <laughs> I was um, taken along a few times. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's now, but it's changed. So that's my, my, my first term, my, my, my kind of problem of, of that. And my second one is, um, I think, a, 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 an even more uh, complex one. Just before I leave that, by the way, that it isn't, that there isn't an, an established... Um, literary tradition of translating neologisms. Alice in Wonderland exists in lots of languages. Finnegan's Wake, there are lots of experiments. Apollinaire has been... You know, you, you can think of lots of cases where translators have played around. Um, but the, 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 the Gattara one seems to me to be something else because it's not just... It's not just the question of the neologism, it is the question of the function of the term and what that role is. And so I, I, I've got a, a problem with that. It's the social context, if you like, in which it's termed. In a way, it's not unlike the your forgiveness example, yeah, yeah, yeah. that you have yeah, something yeah. for which they're, they're, it exists only in a particular social context. OK, but the second example is... Um, Possibly even more problematic. Some years ago, I read, and I cannot remember where I read it, but I came across the questioning of the universal or seemingly universal notion of how we perceive past and future metaphorically. That we perceive the... Um, we talk about um, stepping forward into the future we move towards the future. We are heading forward. The, this huge apparatus of um, <laughs> metaphoric language around moving forward. We move also on from the past. The past is behind us. It's something 
We, so there's a spatial dimension to this as well. We have the spatial dimension. But of course it isn't universal. And I have found a wonderful essay, um, I've hunted for this for a while, from um, Cognitive Science. Cognitive Science in 2006. The title, great title, with the future behind them. Convergent evidence from Aymara language and gesture in the cross-linguistic comparison of spatial constructs of time. Now, don't be put off by that appalling title, because actually what it is, it's a, it's, it's a, um, a couple of linguistic anthropologists who have researched the Aymara language, a, um, a language spoken in uh, the Andes, where, as they put it, the situation in Aymara is the only case in the literature of a mapping where future seems to be metaphorically in back of ego, whereas the past appears to be in front of ego. Which, in one sense, you can understand, because we talk about walking forward into the future, but we can't see the future. The future hasn't yet happened, but we can see the past. And so a concept where you walk forward into your past, as you remember your past, with your future at your, behind you, at your shoulders, is, makes a certain kind of logical sense. But what this draws attention to, of course, is the gap between, um, let's say, imaginative perceptions of time and the way in which those imaginative perceptions are then actually mapped onto physical movement in space. So one could almost argue that we have it the wrong way round. That by, by having the, the sort of more general notion of walking, walking forward into the future, this contradicts what the Aymara peoples present as a much more logical way of looking at it. Now, I, I have absolutely no idea how one would go about translating, uh, were there to be any Aymara texts, which I don't think there are, and how one would go about actually negotiating that. But that seems to me to be another kind of huge translation problem where you have got um, a, in a sense, a, a, it isn't even simply a cultural system. It's an actual way of looking at the world, looking at time present, looking at time past, looking at time future. So really, all I wanted to do in my non-paper, I was told I had 10 minutes, the old boys took a lot longer, um, <laughs> but they always do. But what, what I... to help you. <laughs> what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually leave you just... I'm just going to leave you with these... I ignored him. Leave you with these two examples, because I think that, that, that in a sense... I, we, we had just discussed very generally what we're going to talk about, but I think that you can clearly see the threads that are coming through. Um, but my big question, I suppose, thinking from a translation studies perspective, is how, how to describe, how to label these translation problems. Mm -hmm. Both my Gatara example and my yes. past and future. I do not know how really to describe these and what kind of terminology I can use. And I suspect that translation studies hasn't got a terminology that we can employ. So I'm going to leave it at that and open the discussion. So to open the discussion, that there are lots and lots of things that we can pick up from here. Um, there are issues about knowing and not knowing and how that, that works with translation. Uh, there are questions to do with with the limits, if you want, as well as the ubiquity. So, so how we, and, and I think that comes up again in all three yeah. papers, how we limit, uh, how we define um, issues and, and notions of translation. There are questions also about the specific problems that emerge, but there are questions, I think, also very importantly, probably here, about um, practice both academic practice and, mm. and, and translation mm. practice. And, and so the way in which we think, for instance, about you know, translation and translation studies as 
possibly one of those areas that can reconcile, but also at the same time show the futility of those separations that have become quite fashionable between, we were talking about this again, of coffee, uh, between distant learning and close learning, mm -hmm. between the, the systemic mm -hmm. view and the textual view. Yeah. So those are the things that I pick up from there. And, and mm -hmm. maybe the first thing that I, I would like to ask you to do is, is you know, quickly to tell us, and I think we can sort of, we, again, we're sort of a quarter of an hour behind, so we can take that quarter of an hour, and uh, hopefully the lunch will still be down there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think that, that my, my question is sense of the opening thing that I, that I would put to you is, okay, what is the role, you know, you've given us some of the issues, some of the problems, but what is the role of those of us who practice translation, those of us who, who practice translation studies, mm -hmm. in, in dealing with some of these problems, but also in showing the importance of some of these problems, mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. the, the sh sort of small confines of what we do? I wonder if you can link that, perhaps, to something that you said, Susan, about the resurgence of mm -hmm. close textual analysis. Um, because it, it, it seems to me that, you know, after 20 or so years of abstract theory, that people are actually coming back to, uh, you know, the texts themselves in one way. And that many of these problems arise as a direct consequence, uh, you know, of, of that kind of, um, uh, you know, micrological analysis mm -hmm. uh, of, 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 of the text. And I mean, I was thinking as well, while Susan, while you were talking about, um, you know, the Aymara issue, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there is, if you like, a kind of translation of that, because I was thinking of Walter Benjamin's Benjamin, yes, uh, Angel of History, Angel of history. Yes. Uh, who yes. backs into the future. Yeah. Yes, yes, um, yes. And of course, it, 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 it really says something about uh, the, the, the nature of political progress and what you bring into the future from the past. Um, and also, of course, your, your, your other issue, with the, which are the, the cat women. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the real problem is, of course, or as, as it seems to me, is when something literal, you know, something that is descriptive becomes metaphorical. In other words, where there is a vehicle and a tenor and the tenor itself is culturally specific, oh. and therefore it becomes ridiculous in one language, but is perfectly acceptable um, I I in another. Yeah. And I mean, you might want to link this as well with um, with, with your intersemiotic mm -hmm. examples. I mean, I always get myself into trouble when I'm in a foreign country, uh, particularly some of the because I, I have a kind of continental way of waving my arms around. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I remember I was talking to my my Greek cousin. We were talking in English, and we were we were talking politics because that was you know what we always talk about. Um, and um, you know I was sort of offering him. Well, you can see what I'm doing now. I was offering him two points, and I said, da 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 da. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> he said, "Don't ever do that." No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> I realised what he was, what, what, what he meant. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I I encountered this this problem as well when I when I was editing the Merchant of Venice because in Act Three, Scene Two, there's a point at which Portia gives herself to Bassanio, um, and she gives him a ring, and the general editors were desperate for me to put in a stage direction. I didn't see the need for it, um, so. Uh, you know, they're supposed to exchange kisses and all that. I said, why don't you say, and I was being very mischievous, I said, why don't you say, Bassanio gives her the finger? <laughs> One of the general editors didn't get the point. <laughs> he was a real scholar. <laughs> But you, you see, you see what I mean. Where, where, where even even gestures yeah. of var various yeah, kinds, uh, you know, have a kind of cultural specificity. Um, well, you've got the biting the thumbs at the start of Romeo and Juliet. Which oh, the is thumb, yeah. thumb biting. Yeah. Thumb biting. Yeah. That, yeah. That's right. That's yeah. Things things of that kind. And I, I wonder, you know, this is where it seems to me that translation of every kind encounters a particular sort of problem. Um, because one constantly tries to receive um, something that you don't understand 
in terms of your own culture. You know, I mean, I could make sense of the Hamlet speech, but, you know, from the position of a late 20th century teenager, um, you know, some vague idea of what was going on. Uh, but that was that. But, I mean, you assimilate into But at the same yourself. time, we all immediately go and, and grasp for those things mm. that will help us to make sense. So precisely mm. like you, mm. I was thinking of Benjamin's um, ancient yeah, history, exactly. as Susan was speaking, but I was also thinking, if you then take it in terms of knowledge and that idea that you mm. cannot see in front of you, then behind that there's also Plato and there's... The of course, the of course. Mm -hmm. So of course. you immediately go and grasp for the sort of things that will help you mm. to somehow appropriate mm. that, somehow yeah, make yeah, sense yeah, of yeah. that. Now, it's, it's not a... It's not a, a, a not fraught process, mm. but it is a process that translation is precisely found. <laughs> Sorry, is that you? Mm. We're going yeah, to you get, yeah. Oh, I see, yeah. yeah, two Thank things you. here. First of all, translation studies. For me, this is two different things. And the one thing I'm interested in is in how translation works in the build-up of cultures. Mm -hmm. So that's a study of how translation works. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have the other, which you call it professional translation studies, where you learn translation as a skill with all the contextual knowledge necessary, etc., etc. Uh, and I think that when you come to Susan's example with, um, with, with, uh, with, with, with time, mm. then we are in a kind of intersection here. Mm -hmm. Because you have certain <coughs> terms for which you are not able to produce proper metalinguistic skills. So you can ask, what, what, what the hell does that mean? And in that case, what often happens is that you simply don't translate. Mm. You take the word. And you even have a Danish word in English because you, didn't, you couldn't translate it. And ombudsman, mm. that, that's a Danish mm. word. You, 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 you didn't have anything for it. So you took the word. So the whole process of not translating, mm. but borrowing word, learn word, etc., are in there. And my Greek example is exactly one of those kind, they mm, take emphasis, mm, mm. and then you forget everything about debt and remission, and it is turned into a new contact. Mm. So instead of changing, translating the word, you simply transfer the same term from one context to another. And then as this context develops, something happens. And that's the process I'm interested in, say, translation as this kind of cultural build up, mm. uh, but not if it was, uh, was it the right word that, that the authors of the Gospels took, or was it oh, the yeah. right word yeah, yeah. that yeah. that's important? That's an interesting concept. If yeah. we did yeah. translation, hypothetical translation history, what yeah. would have happened yeah. if, if the yeah. Greek tradition yeah. had yeah. prevailed? And I, and I have three words, I will just take them briefly here. One is the word shock, <laughs> which we have in many languages, I guess also outside the European language. In the 16th century, it, mean, it meant a material collision. That was it. Mm. Mm. Then it got a political notion. Mm. And then it got in the late, uh, in, in the, late mm. the late 19th century, a mental notion, like in the urban studies of Zimmel and yeah. so on, you were shocked and overwhelmed. Yeah. And, that, was, and mm. that has traveled into the 20th century and is a reason for misunderstanding of many 16th, mm. 17th mm. century mm. texts. The other word is revolution, <laughs> which was a technical term in astronomy. Course, used in yeah. the Copernicus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then later on, actual England, in the 16th century, or versus 17th century, well, around that, when you had the various revolutions in England, it came to mean a social upheaval. Mm. And that went together with a change of time notion, yeah. because you went from a circular notion to a linear notion, where you have breakthroughs and so on and so forth. And my third term will be nostalgia, which... Uh, is a technical Greek word from a, a business which has terminological knowledge, namely medicine. It's from a Swiss mm -hmm. medical student in the 17th century who mm -hmm. found out that the Swiss living in, inside those mountains, mm -hmm. when they went outside, they got ill, physically ill. And he found out if you sent them back to his hometown, they would recover. And he called that nostalgia mm -hmm. as something where you could return. Mm -hmm. And later on, it became a notion related to time. Mm -hmm. And then it became something entirely different because you can't turn back to the past. Mm -hmm. And then it came up that nostalgia was sentimentalizing and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that came up in the, during the 19th century when you have the 
different notions of time and progress and so something come in. Linda Hotchin has a very, very good small article on that mm. history of the term nostalgia, which is not from Greek, it's the terminological. Mm. So there we, we make the choices both on the professional side and in everyday culture that we don't translate. We recontextualize instead. And I think that's a very uh, interesting mm. phenomenon. And I could imagine that in the years to come, just like we have Italian notions in in banking, in French, in hospitals, and so on, and English in, in IT, and so on, that at a certain point within ecobiology, we will all say Katara. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, if, if I can just, yeah, just very quickly, because yeah. I know yeah. we want to, to have lunch, I think um, within your question also is something that's, that has come up, I think, through all the, the papers, and which... I suppose I would, I would express some bias here in saying that I actually think that the study and thinking about translation is gradually becoming more and more important. Yes, and I think it is becoming more and more important not only for people working or saying they work within translation studies. I mean, as you know, mm. I'm not very happy about the idea of translation studies being something apart. Mm. Exactly. I, don't, I don't like the idea, and I think it, it fits very much... There's this... this interesting new book that's just come out on etymology mm. which mm. I've ordered but I haven't read yet but I do think etymology, history of language, general negotiation yeah. and I wanted just to read one, one quote that I have here from Sherry Simon who is working now on um, multilingual cities mm. she's okay. had two, two books one called um, um, Montreal yeah. Episodes in the Life of a Divided City and her latest book, which is Cities in Translation, Intersections of Language and Memory, where she's looking at yeah. cities like Barcelona, Trieste, Calcutta. She's looking at cities where there's, there's this constant movement of language. And her point, and I, 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 I just read you this quote, she points out that the um, translation, she's saying, is basically fundamental to all kinds of cultural development because it involves relationships of exchange different relationships of exchange, sometimes of resistance, sometimes of, of um, intercommunication. And she's pointing out that in bilingual or multilingual cities, this is part of everyday life. And that each yeah. act of translation then highlights ways in which language, cultures and individuals are <laughs> operating with subtle differences in a world they share. And here's the quote. It obliges us to ask, with each proper name, with each cultural reference, with each stylistic trait, with each idiomatic expression, with each swear word, how similar is this reality to its possible replacement in another language? How different? And when do differences climb from the trivial to the substantial? Mm. And I think that's a very, very, <laughs> very good way of looking yeah. at this constant process. But I, I mean, I, I, as I see it, I do see translation as becoming of greater interest in, mm. Mm. let's say, literary and cultural uh, scholarship yeah. Yeah. more yeah. generally. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think, and I, it's with relief when I come back to the papers that we heard this morning and again to, to what we've been saying now, um, that there is this kind of double perception, both of text within a context and a focus on the text. Because, I mean, one of the things, after, after Lefebvre and I developed what we called our cultural turn, I started reading all sorts of things, saying, you know, Basnet and Lefebvre have moved away from language. Yeah, yeah. The object of study is now culture. And you think, what? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. did I write so badly that people <laughs> actually <laughs> thought yeah, yeah. that we're, we're, we're talking about culture and not about language? You cannot, you cannot yeah. pull them apart. Yeah. I, I mean, I, th I think what's going to make... I, I mean, I agree with you about translation. I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's centrality. Um, you know, is in the process of being recognised. Um, but then I, I, I think of terms like post-colonial or gothic, um, and there's a sense in which, I mean, post-colonial particularly was, was politically necessary, but it also, of course, refers to other things. So that if you only have one kind of view of what the dynamic of post-colonial is, um, and you then apply it to everything, it ceases to have any real kind of um, an analytical force. Whereas it seems to me that translation has got so many facets. Um, you know, um, 
I mean, you can translate within a language as well as between languages. And the question then, of course, is, uh, is what exactly are, are you doing? And it's a question then of making people aware yes. of what they're doing. Yeah, and precisely. It's, it's an awareness raising. Yeah. Ra ra you know, something like the Gothic. I mean, you know, you, you say ev everything's Gothic. You know, I mean, I, I look at the TV. I mean, I, it, one of these days, the news is going to be Gothic. It's almost there. And you know, the, the term then dissolves. Yeah. Because it's fashionable. And I, I think the thing about translation, the more one thinks of it, the less easy it is to dissolve it. Because, of course, it, it, it contains a whole range of philosophical questions about the nature of language. And also, of course, it addresses the specificities of culture. Um, I also think, if I may, that there's a, there is an area there, which is very interesting, it goes oh. back to Sherry Simon's work on multilingual cities. And that is that... And, and that is a very political point also oh, about indeed. translation. And mm. that is that there is still, if you hold on, Jakobson's distinction is very useful and we mm -hmm. need to work with yeah. it. At the same time, it's also true that if you hold on to that sense that, this, that there is an inherent homogeneity to mm. a language and that somehow, you know, we, we have that kind of association, political association, that says that, that homogeneity is then reflected in the community mm. around mm. it. So if you hold on to that, somehow you're doing a disservice to translation. I think mm. what you're talking about, what, what Susan was mentioning, what you were talking about you know, with Sherry Simon's work, for instance, mm. is, is much more interesting because it also tells you that translation somehow is always already there mm. and that that homogeneity is something that is a bit of a myth that has held up mm. you know, the, the kind of national... Um, sort of construction, for instance, mm. that we have had, and a series of other constructions that have gone mm, with that. Mm, mm. So in that sense, I think we can also use translation mm. in a very political way to mm. say, mm. yes, there are differences, and there are substantive, substantive differences between translating between languages, etc. But let's not think that the norm is that people are monolingual, that the norm is that people mm. never well, encounter they're translation, they're not, yeah. that yeah. the norm is that the world is made of homogeneous communities that work in one language. Translation is there. Yeah. And it's there all the time. Yeah. 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 But at the same time, I think, and that's why I made that distinction mm. before, between studying translation as this kind of all permeating factor yeah. in a culture where you have uh, based on languages which cultures are, and no languages alone. I mean, that's, 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 that, I mean, that's my point here. So for me, uh, Emily Apt has spoken translation as, mm. as a new foundation for comparative studies, comparative literature, mm. but comparative studies also. And those uh, contact zone cities like mm. like like you're yeah. going to, yeah. they are not new phenomena, mm. but they make extremely visible, yes. which yeah. have always been there, and I think that's a very important thing. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So this yeah. kind of thing where we can stick to ubiquity of translations as a cultural fact, but we cannot use that as a model for a translation startup problem because then we will mm. yeah. do away with all yes. differences. Yeah. Yeah. And on the yeah. other hand, we cannot take the professional understanding of knowing a language or doing translation in a proper way, good and bad translation. This is professional use, and that's a co just a corner, mm. and you cannot use it as a model mm. for what translation in general is. If you do that, you will also do away with the differences, because then translation would be without any boundaries. So I just think the Translation as a discipline might, like all disciplines, it, the boundaries might vary, but yeah. there will and must be boundaries. But there's no boundaries for the role of translation in cultural, say, reality. And I think we have to be very, very sharp on uh, keeping those uh, apart. Yeah, but it's more difficult to do that now with the advances in technology. And I mean, one of the things that we haven't mentioned at all is advances in technology. You know, when, when, it, when you have cultures that move, I mean, when I, I did Welsh in university, one of, the, one of the elements was that you traced Welsh words back to indo brythonic originals. Yeah. Okay, and there was, a, there was a methodology for doing this. Um, and it, it was all very logical. You could do the same with, you know, tra um, uh, sort of trying to determine the Latin element yeah. in the Welsh language. And again, very methodical. And, you know, you could then map that onto the movements of different groups, say, within Europe or an e Eastern Europe. But, I mean, now with, with the speed of technology, I mean, there, is n there can be no language, virtually, that mm. is, n is untouched by any other language. 
And there is a sense that the moment you start asking questions about source and origin, I mean, I would be interested in, 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 in the Greek things that you, that, that you were suggesting, that if one went right behind those particular concepts, you would find others. Yes. And pretty mm. soon you would become absolutely frustrated because you would never touch base. I mean, it's, it's like asking all these questions about the origins of language. I've, I've never believed this nonsense about, well, you start off by grunting and groaning and then all of a sudden language emerges, <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, and I mean, you know, the films like 10,000 BC where, you know, Raquel Welsh... Um, <laughs> and, That's a problem. And I don't know who, I, I can't remember his name now. Can but I stop you on yeah. Raquel Welsh? Yes. 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 You all know the reference. Stop it. <laughs> As you can see, this, this could be unstoppable.